us. Welcome, okay. everybody. Suzanne and I are just so delighted for the people that have been with us the last couple of weeks and the people that are joining us afresh. Welcome, everyone. And thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. I'm a developmental psychologist, and I um, spent about 20 years doing research on why connection matters. And it's about 10 years ago now that I really wanted to find ways to get help the wider public to understand this stuff. And so being able to have children first talk about it and have parent line talk about it, I hope really helps people to relax so that we know just the power of being with other people, the power of relationships and connection. We wanted to have this series of conversations about laughter, organizing, and listening. So those were our three topics. Here's what I'm talking about today. I thought I would talk about why relationships matter, why listening helps, and end with some ideas for boosting listening. So let's start with why relationships matter so much. And I'm gonna start in the same place that I have started every single one of these three sessions because it is for me the most, the most basic insight and it is that babies arrive already connected to other people. This is Daniel. He was born during lockdown and that's his mom, Kelly. And they sent me a photograph of the two of them you know, when he's less than 30 minutes old. You can see the connection between them. You can see that his eyes are totally clapped on hers. Babies arrive already connected to other people. They arrive with a brain that expects other people, that's already tuned into their voices, that's expecting an eyes and a mouth, in other words, a face configuration. Connection is central to who we are as human beings. And my question to myself is always, how do I help people to understand that? So in this series, we started with that picture and then I brought in another one. Here's a grandma. She's in the delivery suite. This picture was sent to me by her, all excited because she now understood in a deeper way that this picture that had been snapped in the delivery suite when the baby was less than 10 minutes old showed connection. If that grandma had been around through the whole of the pregnancy, especially those last few months, that baby will already have known that grandma's voice. That's how much it's woven in. And then as I was putting together today's slides, I thought, oh, I haven't shown any daddies. In other words, any men. I don't have any pictures of grandas this way. So the closest I got, this is Daniel's daddy. He's less than 30 minutes old and you can see the connection going on between Daniel and his daddy. How do I help people to get how connected babies are to other people? How do I demonstrate that? Well, I thought I would end this time with a video. This is research by somebody named Dr. Vasi Reddy, and she works with babies trying to show how connected they are. And this is a piece that was in the paper in 2013, which talked about new research that she had just published about really young babies and their ability to read other people. It's an illustration of connection. And I have one of the videos that went into that research right here. Okay, there is no sound. It's a really ordinary research video. And yet I think that what it shows us is just how connected babies are in a really fundamental kind of profound way. Because that baby is lying looking at his mom and that baby's two months old. A two month old doesn't even yet have the capacity to pick up her own head. And yet we're gonna see how good she is at reading mom when mom comes to pick her up. Because in this study, they just got mothers to slow down the process of picking up their babies so that we could see how in tune babies are. So watch this. The mom just slowly says, shall I pick you up? I'm gonna pick you up now and watch what happens. The baby helps her. The baby literally reads her mother's intention. Can I show you that one more time? 
because what I'm trying to help us to do is to just think about the fact that human beings need relationships, that we read connection and other people even at this really early age. So mom slowly lets the baby know, I'm gonna pick you up now. She puts out her hands to say, okay, I'm getting ready to pick you up. And the baby is not passive. The baby joins her. The baby puts up her arms and her legs, stiffening her body to make it easier for her mother to pick her up. She's, she's connecting, she's reading her mother's intentions long before she can consciously do that and long before she has any words for it. That for me is an example of the connection that human beings come wired with. Okay, so that for me is the most important idea. It underpins why listening works so well in helping to calm other people. And this is the other idea. It affects our brains and our bodies. It affects our very biology. I call those saber tooth tiger and teddy bear moments, i.e. what we feel about things that are scary and unpredictable and how we have safety. And I've mentioned the last couple of times we published this book over lockdown to help understand that idea that what language do we use to help people to get ideas that often scare them? This word biology. Well, I think we can talk about brains and bodies in ways that make that really easy to understand. So in your children's bodies, they have a saber-toothed tiger system and a teddy bear system. And together, those make up the stress system. And actually, so do you. You have a saber-toothed tiger system and a teddy bear system in your body as well. And you need that stress system to cope with whatever happens to you in every minute of the day. It's just that it's often being triggered into your saber-toothed tiger system or into your teddy bear system without you having any awareness of it, without you even agreeing. So when your child starts to shout, runs upstairs, slams the door and says, I hate you, your saber tooth tiger system is very likely to be triggered. It can be hard for you to get back into your teddy bear system. And yet, maybe just understanding a little bit of this will help you to remember that will help you to think, okay, the first thing I need to do is I need to get back into my teddy bear system. I need to know what my brain is saying to me to help me relax into my teddy bear system. Underneath all behavior for all of us human beings, underneath how we feel is what our body is doing with whatever's happening and the sense that we're making of it. Another word for that is the self-regulatory system. And the only reason I pop that up there is because when we call it that, that means our ability to regulate our emotions, our ability to take care of them is actually part of our stress system. And then underneath all of that is our behavior system. Okay, so that, another, that all of that is underneath how we're behaving. So all I'm trying to do here is to find ways to help us to have this really basic but profound idea that all of your children's behavior is underpinned by a stress system, even when it doesn't make sense to you. And all of your behavior is as well. Okay. And so here's a bit of feedback that we had from that very first session when I talked about laughter. So we had somebody who was on that session write to me to say this. Can I say a massive thanks for your webinar conversation about laughter with Children First last week? This is a member of a kinship care family. It was quite ironic because I happened to watch that session just before the child in our family arrived for an overnight with me from her grandparents. We had such a lot of laughter 
And here for me is the important part. Even on a few occasions when I felt a bit frustrated, I had it in my mind to create laughter because of the session where you talked about tigers and teddies. So I just offer that back to all of you so that you have a sense of what other people are doing with this information. You're all in individual houses. We're not in a big group together where we could share stories easily. I think it is remarkable that talking about something as simple as laughter could help people in the middle of frustrated moments. And if we can talk about something as light and as powerful as laughter, then we can also talk about something as light and fundamental as listening. So with that background that we arrive all connected and that it affects our biology, let's look at listening for a few minutes. Why does just listening to your children and to other people help? Why is that? And here's why. It lies in everything I just said. Unpredictability is scary. Unpredictability is a saber-toothed tiger time. And predictability, knowing what will happen, feels safe. So when you know that you are going to be heard, that your feelings will be acknowledged, and you know that that is reliable, that feels safe. Your body gets used to it. It comes to predict that I will feel heard. And the thing about your children in kinship care families, they have had experiences of not feeling heard or they wouldn't have been in kinship care. In other words, something has happened to make a change in the family and that something will have been big and un unpredicted, very possibly, but it will have been big and it will have created some fear that happens in tons of families. There are often moments of feeling unheard through every day, but in kinship families, it means that something has happened for the youngsters so that they may have become really predicting that they may not feel heard. And the reason I'm stressing that is because it helps you, I hope, to, to realize I'm going to have to work a bit harder, maybe to help the child in my family feel heard. But if I keep thinking about how to create senses of safety, moments of safety, every time I help them feel heard, I boost the teddy bear system in their body. Not feeling heard is scary. Feeling heard is safe. It's a really simple idea but it lies at the heart of everything we're talking about today. And I hope that making it as simple as that, that not feeling hurt is scary and feeling hurt is safe. I hope that will help you in the moments when it gets tough, in the moments when you start to get frustrated. That if you can just remember, okay, Suzanne said, not feeling hurt is scary and feeling hurt is safe. What can I do at the moment to help this child to feel hurt? And can I extend that? What can you do to help yourself feel heard? Will also to help you put you back into a safe place. And the calmer and safer you feel, the better able you are to hear your children's feelings too. Okay. So here's another image that says that. Feeling heard creates a sense of safety in the body. Now, while I was thinking about this week and I did a bit of tweeting, here's somebody who responded just yesterday. So here's Jen Latrobe, and I think Jen may even be with us this morning. She said, I listened to a podcast the other day, which stuck with me. We can't feel seen until we're heard. So to have someone listen and really hear us is so powerful. So she's picking up on the idea at the core of this morning. Stressing those other things, your stress system, 
your brain with all its neural pathways, whether you're wired for teddy bear moments or you're wired for saber tooth tiger moments, all of that is underpinning this. How do we talk about that? Well, here's somebody else who's talking about that. This is the Center for Parenting Education. Now, I'm not sure that I like that word parenting education, but they've got a great article. And so if you want to read more about this after this morning, it's an article that I would recommend. Oh, and Parent Line can put that out so that you can find that. Okay, here's a key idea from that article. Active listening is the single most important skill you have in your parenting tool belt. And that's why I wanted to put this quote up. The single most important skill you have. So what they think is that of all the things you could do as a carer or as a parent, the most important skill you have is to listen. Active listening is a, what they call a specific form of communication that lets another person know you're with them. And by that specific form of communication, that's fancy words that mean I'm listening really closely and taking in everything you're telling me. That you're with them. That you're aware of what they're saying. That you're accepting their perspective and you're thinking about the situation they're dealing with. Here's one more bit from that article. It can feel a relief to learn that you do not need to fix everything for your child. I think this is a relief. And I also think it's hard. Here's the relief bit. You do not need to fix everything for your child. When they are struggling with life, you don't, you don't have to sort everything with their friends. You don't have to sort everything with their teachers. You don't have to sort everything with their tech. You don't have to fix everything. What you need to do, first and foremost, is simply listen to them. Because then you communicate that they're worthy of your attention. And many of your children will be struggling with a sense of worthiness. You hear their distress. When they have a sense that you hear that, then you demonstrate that their view of the world has merit. And by allowing them time to decide what they want to do, you indicate that you trust their ability to solve their problems. In other words, just listening empowers them. It gives them a sense of their own capacities. And for many of your children, they will carry doubt about their capacities to deal with the difficult things in life. So just being able to hear them really makes a difference. But here is the hard bit. You want to fix it. It's really hard sitting with other people who are in pain, who you love, and you can't take away their pain. So often our wish to fix things for our children is because it would help us. It would, we would know that our children had quit being in pain. So the courage that this takes resides in the fact that you need to be with them in pain that you can't make go away. It's both a relief and it's a bit hard to hear, which is why I've just taken time with this one slide to really unpack that idea. I hope that it's both. It's an affirmation of the relief. And if it's an affirmation that it can be really hard to know this. Feeling heard creates a sense of safety. And very often that's all you need to do is create a sense of safety. And then the child can figure out how to fix their own problems. You don't have to feel like you have to do it for them. So let me try one more way to say that. When you feel heard, it chases away the saber tooth tigers. It pushes them away. It makes them back off. Because you aren't alone with it. 
you aren't facing those big, scary, big teeth on your own. Somebody is there with you. That's what produces the sense of safety, is companionship. Okay, so let me think just for a moment. Okay, but why is listening so hard, Suzanne? It sounds simple, everything you just said, but often it's really, really hard. I just wanted to touch on this for a moment. If you want more of this after today, you could Google for something called Circle of Security. And this is an image from one of their animations. And they talk about why listening is often so hard. So if you take this scenario where you say something easy to your child, like we've been to the park, we've had a good time, now it's time to go, it's a very reasonable thing you've said. And your child starts to have a meltdown, starts to cry, starts to protest, starts to say, I don't want to go. Very often, that triggers your own stress system. So now, a loudly crying child, in this scenario that I just made up, is embarrassing for you. You start to wonder, what are the other people around thinking? So your stress system gets triggered, both in the present and perhaps even in the past. So one of the interesting things about listening and feeling heard is that it's not just about the present, it's also about our unconscious past. If you didn't have good experiences of being heard when you were a child, then having a child who's crying can trigger your past. In other words, they can trigger the sense of what it's like to feel unheard in you. It triggers your own unconscious. So I'm just trying to pause on that just for a moment. We could have a whole nother webinar just on that. But I'm just trying to pose on it just for a moment to say, if you find listening hard, that's understandable. There are reasons for that. So don't give yourself a hard time. Get curious about why listening can feel hard, about why it is so hard when your child resists the very reasonable things you suggest, or why it is so hard when a teacher doesn't listen to your child's pain. If you can get curious about why listening is hard for you, you actually start to, you start to discover some of the things that would make it easier for you to do this basic thing your child needs, which is to feel heard. So if you can find ways to boost your, this, segre, this teddy bear system in your own body, and if you can find ways to wonder what is your brain doing in stressful moments, then you too help to create a sense of feeling heard for yourself. Okay. So with those ideas behind us, let me just close by looking at a few ideas that might help you to boost listening moments in your family. Okay, here's one. I've popped up this image of a mobile phone because mobile phones are now part of all our lives. And indeed, if we didn't have the technology of mobile phones, we actually wouldn't have been able to have any of these seminars because it's all this digital tech stuff that has helped us to connect over lockdown and that actually you know, helps all of life has changed in the last 20 years. Mobile phones have become part of all our lives. And that has both benefits and uh, advantages and disadvantages. For some people, a phone feels like they come between in other words, at a table, if you're all trying to have dinner and you want to have conversation and someone's got their phone, it can feel like it comes between you, that you're not feeling heard. And in fact, some families have decided that they'll have a ritual where everybody puts down their phones while we're having dinner so that it's a time to connect in person. And yet for other people, Phones are an easier way to connect. So for those of you with teenagers, you might find that one of the ways you feel like you're, that your teenager connects is when you're texting back. 
Okay, so this is just an image that for me helped us to think about how do we connect these days? However you do it, by phone or not by phone, by Zoom or in the room together, by telephone, the feeling is what matters. So if you can concentrate on how can I help to create the feeling of being heard by any means, that's what will matter. And one of the interesting things is that the way that your child feels heard may not be the way that you feel heard. So for lots of oldies, like me, feeling heard is what happens when you do this with my eyes. For lots of youngsters, I think they feel heard through digital formats in ways that don't make sense, don't make intuitive sense to people in, an, in another generation because we didn't grow up with that. So if you could get curious and talk with your youngsters about how they feel heard and just tune into that by watching, you start to get another, uh, some of the underlying sense of all of this, um, that there are ways to connect even, um, you know, it, in other words, it's not necessarily like those baby pictures I showed, it can be done in other ways too. Okay. I want to come back to this idea of active listening. Okay. And I just want to stress acceptance is key to really active listening. When you are actively listening, there's no judgment and no evaluation of what the speaker is saying. Parents often resist at this point that piece that I talked about before, thinking that active listening implies that you have to, that you're agreeing with what your child's saying. And I just wanted to stress accepting is not the same as agreeing. So if your child says, I hate you, you're so unfair to me. <clears throat> it's very understandable that you might want to come back and say, how dare you say that I am not fair. All I have said is that you cannot have a third piece of chocolate. I hope you're laughing out there because I'm trying to do a role play of a big drama in a family. <clears throat> Accepting that they feel like it's unfair is the starting place. I hear that you feel that that's unfair. It's not the same as agreeing that it's unfair. What you're doing is that you're signaling you hear the feeling and pulling apart the acceptance from the agreement often lets us relax. So <clears throat> a third thing you can do is name feelings. And I was doing that in the example that I just gave you. I hear that you feel that unfair. It feels unfair. I hear that you're angry. Um, if your child says, I hate you, okay, I hear that right now you hate me. If you give back the feeling words that they use, that increases their sense that they feel heard. Their brain notes the similarity in those words. If you have a child who's struggling with feelings, you might try introducing them. I'm wondering if you're feeling lonely. I wonder if you're missing your mom. Missing moms and dads and people in kidship families is really common because there's the complexity of families. So sometimes it's easy to think maybe we shouldn't talk about that, especially if there are problems with contact. And a lot of those problems have renewed in lockdown. If you name the feelings, it creates safety even when they are scary, difficult feelings. And so I wanted to pop this slide up there and there's more that you can go and read about if you want to, because talking about the, the difficult feelings, it's very easy to think maybe we shouldn't talk about those. And yet naming feelings, the science tells us, helps bodies to start to relax even when they are difficult feelings. And that's why when we come back to the end of this morning, Anne will tell you Parent Line is there for you. Parent Line is there to talk about your difficult feelings too. Parent Line is willing to listen to you say really hard things like, 
right now I don't think I like this child anymore. That is very scary for you to say out loud. Parent line exists to do active listening and to hear without judgment that right now you don't like this child anymore. And they are also there to hear the moments when you go, remember when I called you three weeks ago and I didn't like that child anymore? We've been talking about feelings a lot. We tried what you suggested. And now actually today, I really like this child. Okay, so whatever feelings are, if we can name them and look at them, it helps us to cope with even the things that feel difficult. Here's a fourth idea. You can make a ritual of listening. So I popped this picture in because we've all been doing this ritual during lockdown. We've been clapping every Thursday night. A little five minute moment through the whole of the week to help the NHS to know that they are appreciated. And that's mattered because the whole of the country has got in on that. That's a ritual of caring. Well, you can make a ritual of listening. If you set aside a time during the day so that that's when you're gonna make sure people are feeling heard, it might be over dinner or it might be at bedtime. Then it becomes predictable that there will definitely be a time during the day when I'll feel heard. It'll be good if there are other moments during the day as well. But if there is one point in the day when your family sets out to try to create a moment of feeling heard, make a game out of that, then that starts to become predictable. And there's a moment in the day that a child knows that they will feel safe, even if what you're feeling heard about are difficult feelings. And finally, when things get difficult, you might think, Suzanne, what should I remember? What should I think about when times get difficult? Should I think about teddies? Should I think about creating teddies? Teddy bear moments. And you know what? As I was putting this together, I thought, no. Think about tigers. If you can remember that your child is scared, that your child is feeling unsafe, that's more likely to increase your sense of wanting to help. That's more likely to increase compassion. That gives you the why for creating teddy bear moments. If you can remember that even when your child's behavior is not, is difficult and they're doing something that makes it hard for you to remember that you like them, when you feel frustrated, if you can remember that they are in the middle of a saber tooth tiger moment and they're scared and they're distressed, it, it sometimes helps you to relax and ease because then, then you know that what you need to do is to step in and help. And your children will have lots and lots of saber tooth tiger moments. So in conclusion, your listening matters. If you know that you matter and what you do matter, it helps in the moments that you feel uncertain. So if your listening matters, if you're listening to your children matters, I wanted to end on these three thoughts because this is the end of our series. Listening to your own needs matters too. If you are listening to when you have saber tooth tiger moments and how you get yourself back into a sense of safety, that matters. If you listen to your own sadness, because I know there will be lots of sad moments, if you find ways to help with that, and that might be calling parent line, and it might be calling friends, and it might be having an extra bowl of ice cream, listening to your sadness matters. And celebrating your successes matters. Every tiny moment that you have, every moment that you have a little bit of laughter, every moment that you share even a small smile, Every moment when you feel relieved and can breathe out, I handled that one well. Celebrate your successes. Don't let them go unnoticed because it's in those successes that you build the strength to have teddy bear moments to deal with the saber tooth tiger moments that are to come. Celebrating successes gets us through the hard times. Thank you. And Thanks, Suzanne. Over that, you. that was that was superb. Thank you. I did so many thoughts went through my head. I often have a lot of conversations with kinship carers and parents on in parent line on the phones, and accepting and acknowledging a child's behaviour. And I think, especially, 
at moments when teenagers who it's really hard and their behavior might be completely off the wall, accepting that they're angry or accepting the feeling they're having, not, not the behavior, but the behavior's trying to tell you what's behind that feeling. Exactly. So if you speak to the feeling, it helps with the behavior. Right. And in our society, it teaches us to deal with the behavior. Our, we, our cultural style doesn't help us to, to pay attention to feelings. And so this can feel a big shift to people. But what I tried to highlight is that it, it, it's based, we now know so much more about relationships. We have a whole science of how bodies work. And I've just, during this series, been trying to highlight a little bit of that science, which I hope helps to boost people's confidence that you could try stuff that might feel new yeah. because it really can be countercultural. So I think of it this way. Whatever you are telling me that you're feeling or you think, my first response is always, okay. Okay, that doesn't mean I feel feel okay about it it means that i am accepting of that i just heard what you said i now make it a habit whatever someone is saying to me i try really hard to start with okay breathe silence and that gives me time to pull myself together and it also helps them to hear that my response has been okay okay I hear you're angry. Okay, I hear you don't want to come home. Okay, I hear that you just smashed the window. Starting with okay, it starts to create that sense of safety that I'm talking about. And so in other words, it's just a little linguistic habit that helps me to do what you just said, Anne. It helps me to accept. It doesn't mean that, it doesn't mean that breaking the window was okay. It does mean, however, okay, you are feeling so extreme. I hear the feeling. Let's deal with the feeling. And then we can come back to the behavior. Your experiences of other people shape your biology. Okay, we become wired for the way we have been treated. And lots of children in kinship care, because something was, you know, they're, they've had chaotic experiences of family, they become wired for not trusting because that was smart. They made sense when they were in a family where there was lots of chaos. Yeah. But when they then come to other situations like school or your family, or when they grow up and they try to have an adult relationship, that not trusting is a which made sense in their first family is not going to help them so much in their later family. And so doing whatever we can to help them to grow a sense of trust serves them whilst also knowing that that can be really tiring and can take constant work on your part, which is why my heart goes out to yes. all the people who can stick with it and can take care of your own teddy bear systems. You can then see the journey more easily. Yeah. And we often talk to people on, uh, in Parent Line about finding the moments, the right moment. And, and frequently, the thing is I don't, that I'm laughing about it because frequently it's not the right moment for you. <laughs> oh my. It's frequently the right moment for them. And now that might be at half 11 when you're absolutely dead in your feet. Absolutely. And they now are opening up, you yep. know. It might, be, it might be when you're in the middle of trying to get the dinner and the, the pot's boiling over or something and they're going, now's the time I'm approaching you and I really want you to hear me. And it's those moments where we have to kind of go, okay, can I do both? And is that, yeah. and how do we, I, I help them know that I really do want to hear them? What I'm trying to do right now is create a sense of safety. I'm trying to get you back to your teddy bear system. And it may be hard for the child to do that. And it's even harder if you're not in your teddy bear system. Okay. So if you really can't listen right now, that's okay. You can't always listen in the moment. If you signal your willingness to listen, I hear that you are angry at me and I will listen to this. Can you give me five minutes 
to finish this and I will come back. So if you signal it, okay? Or we've, we've talked, you know, we've been talking about it. Honey, can we go to sleep? And when we come back, we will pick up this conversation in the morning. In other words, if you are signaling when you will come back, that gives you space to, to be flexible with this so that you don't push yourself into a place where you're so tired you can't do the listening. Mm -hmm. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, absolutely, and I suppose just the, uh, one other thing on, on the, the, the right moment, we often say, um, whatever the age of the child actually, it, uh, going for a walk, doing something active, where yeah. you're not absolutely looking at the person, it's, it's a lot easier to open up and you feel less judged, especially if it's something that's quite hard to see. And I think, I think that's something that I've noticed a lot now at the moment with lockdown that everybody's out walking. And I'm just so hopeful that the conversations that are going on are really good. You know, because I think yeah. that's something. And other times it's in the car. The kids might be in the back seat and you could be driving and the conversations are easier to have. So it's about thinking about the space and where you are and where you're all in a good space is the best, obviously. But to keep taking opportunities where they arise and seeing the behavior as a means of communication. And, and within that behavior, whatever the age of the child. Yes, whatever the age. You're you're trying to create a sense of safety okay so we've got a great question here from emily yes absolutely um, what do you do when the child seems too young to express themselves like they're three or four and they just shout or scream or push or kick or laugh feeling heard doesn't have to happen simply through words okay mm -hmm. that's why i showed that picture of that granny ha hanging on to a child <clears throat> feeling heard is about having someone respond to you in a whole range of ways. It's about having someone be with you. So playing together with a child, doing Legos with a three-year-old, um, noticing where they're looking, saying, ah, I can see you looking at that banana. Would you like a banana? Um, saying, kicking with them. Okay. So you might move. If they're kicking, you might go, I can see you doing that. The correspondence is the correspondence between two people that the brain clocks. You feel heard because someone is on the same place as you. So if your child is really young and language doesn't work for really young children, in fact, language doesn't work for teenagers either often, and it in fact doesn't even work for adults, especially when we're, when we're, when we're in intense emotional places, whatever you can do to create a sense of correspondence, and if you're thinking, okay, my job here is to help you to feel safe, then that will work for children who are young. So Emily, if you think, okay, if I make, if I make a facial expression that captures what I think you're feeling, oh honey, you're feeling so angry, I can see that. Okay, but because of the format of this, can you see my face? Right, it lets all of you see how powerful a facial expression can be as long as the child knows that you are trying to be with them. It's what's really interesting. In other words, the children read your intention. Here's mm -hmm. the alternative to that. Being with is so important. And lots of children experience moments of humiliation when people gave them back their facial expression, but they did it with the intention to make fun of them, to tease them, to humiliate them. And if that happens enough for a child, then they get humiliation built into their brain and their body. So what I find fascinating <clears throat> is that the reason that it works when it's corresponding is the same reason that it feels so betraying if you're not on a on the plane where you're yeah. trying to be with the child in emotions. Yeah. I find that absolutely fascinating. And for me, it's another illustration of what it means that we come into the world already connected and reading other people making yeah. sense of relationships I, I, it's building up resilience it's building up safety because you are learning that you don't have to be alone with anger or sadness yeah. or yeah. loneliness you 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 don't 
have to be alone with those feelings. And many children learn that they do have to be alone with them. And so what kinship carers are doing is helping them to relearn what relationships feel like. And I commend every single one of you out there as we come to the end of this series. It has been an absolute delight to be able to talk about this and to hear and to see in the chat that you're finding these ideas helpful. Yeah. So before we go, just to tell you, you know, I mean, we've got <clears throat> print line numbers here and our website and Children First. Um, we're all we're here every day of the year to support you. If anything today or any other day, you know, you feel actually I could just do with somebody to talk to, you know, not only the practical stuff, you know, give advice. We can talk through the strategies that we've talked about today. But we can also listen to you. Sometimes you're just at the end of your tether and you just need somebody to just let off steam too. And as, as you very nicely said earlier on, Suzanne, there's an anonymity and a safety on a phone. You can really share and be very honest about how you're feeling and you won't be judged. And there's something very powerful about that. And there's something very it feels so, it, you feel lighter at the end of it. I think people have genuinely said that it, it helps in so many ways. So if there's anything you want to talk about today, two weeks down the line, a year down the line, please give us a phone. It's been lovely yeah. to be with you. Yeah, so Indeed. take care everybody and Bye. to hear from you. Bye. See you later.